one, there's one, it's going to get, oh, I don't know if I should do this. And if you guys want to skip this, you can tell me. But we're going to take a turn into a place that's just a, it's, it's just a little bit serious. And I, I hope you're all cool with this. I hope it's all right. Um, I, so I think it's fine. Um, so we had uh, two members who um, independently asked me if we could devote a whole night just to discussing pedophilia. And as important a subject as I think it is to discuss, I don't know if this is the proper venue. I don't know. I don't know. Um, now, I think that having some kind of conversation over this is really important. Um, and I wanted to do a little bit of research on the on how many people uh, might out, be out there that are pedophiles, on uh, how many children have reported these things. And as I was doing this research, I found myself that I, I just couldn't. I couldn't actually do this research. I couldn't type anything into Google. I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't get myself to do that. I thought even using uh, Tor browser, you know, some kind of built-in VPN into the browser, using a VPN on my computer, using a public computer, anything, I didn't feel comfortable doing any of these searches to find finding any information, right? Um, but there are some podcasts out there that I was able to do a little bit of searching on, uh, and I found some things. So I'd like to share a little bit about, about that with you, um, and then we can do a little conversation. Um, is there anybody that, like, desperately does not want to talk about this? Yeah, Simone, please. Yeah, so number one is ask questions, um, but the most important one, number four, is please assume positive intent. Yeah. We're not talking about having positive intent for the perpetrators of pedophilia. We're talking about having positive intent for the people who are discussing this, who are discussing this. So... You think it's not possible to have a conversation with other people and assume positive intent? Okay, maybe maybe we'll sk maybe we'll skip the conversation then if you yeah if, if we really feel uncomfortable with it and maybe we can check in again uh, right before the conversation. Does that sound okay? Okay, yeah. Um. I, I, I agree. So um, let's all just keep that in mind. Please do assume positive intent. Um, know that I'm here just because this it's a fetish night. This is a fetish that is really important to discuss. And actually, we're going to talk a little bit about why um, it's probably so important to discuss. Um, so of course, the prevalence of pedophilia is unknown. Of course, nobody self-reports that they're a pedophile. We don't know how many are out there. Interestingly, on that chart that we saw of those 2,044 people who were surveyed um, in that study, th there were at least a few people who recognized that they did have a sexual attraction and children as reported on that. So we can say at least one or two out of a sample size of 2,044, which is actually a much higher prevalence than what I had assumed. Um, maybe it's higher than this. We just don't know. We have no idea, of course. Okay. Now, as our understanding of the inner workings of the brain increases, as we better understand human drive and why we do the things that we do, it's really shifted our judiciary system. It's really shifted the way that we penalize people and what we send people to jail for. It seems like the more that we understand why people commit certain crimes, why people commit acts of violence, why people um, might steal, when we understand the psychology that goes behind it, we tend to be able to have a better, um, uh, more willingness to forgive them, these people. Um, and if we find that this is a person who suffers from some kind of um, uh, mental disability, we actually don't send them to jail at all. Oftentimes we'll send them to a, to a home where, they're, uh, where we're able to give them psychological treatments to try to get them better. We say you're a sick person who needs to get better. Now interestingly, this is not the case when we talk about pedophilia. Pedophilia is a topic where it doesn't matter the reason why you might be considered a pedophile. Uh, I'm not saying every single person in the world is this way, but I'm saying society as a whole, um, we still demonize all pedophiles that are out there. Because of this, there are basically no support structures that exist. 
If a person were to recognize in themselves that they were a pedophile, they would not be able to tell any of their loved ones, tell any of their friends. They couldn't do a Google search. They couldn't tell their counselor. They have no one to tell. And what we know about any kind of psychological disturbance, the more we try to suppress it, the stronger it builds up inside of us, right? So it's actually, I think it's really important that we, that there's some, I do want to be very careful with my words. Thank you, Simone. Please do assume positive intent here. Um, I think that it is very important that there's some kind of space or some kind of avenue where when someone recognizes this in themselves, they're able to talk about it. They're able to let it out. Um, so they don't just have to keep it in because when you keep it in, eventually it's going to take over the person. It's going to manifest and they're going to act on this impulse. Now, there are some anonymous online support groups. Um, in the, the podcast that I heard on this, there, um, th there's an anonymous support group that requires that everyone in the support group has never acted on their impulse, but they recognize that they have these impulses and they want to get better, and they find that it's extremely important to have a group of people that they can talk to when they have these impulses, that they can let this stuff out. They all say it's extremely beneficial and that it's kept them on the right track. Now, there's a, there's a saying, which is, porn up, rape down. So what we've seen around the world is that if there's a country or a state wherein porn is illegal, once porn is made legal, we see a substantial decrease in the number of rape cases, right? It's, we don't see that when rape, the, the, we don't see that when pornography is legalized that there's an increase in rape and sexual deviance. We actually see a decrease that people are able to let out their sexual frustration via these pornographic videos. Now, um, in, <laughs> there was a few years ago made a preteen sex doll. If anyone's familiar with any kind of sex doll, same thing, but um, it's anatomically structured to represent um, uh, someone who's prepubescent. Now, this is designed exactly for people who have pedophilic tendencies who do not want to act on them. This was created with the intention of helping and saving children from sexual victimization. Um, and yet there was a huge controversy around this, of course, as we all can understand. Um, now, when we talk about video games, when we have a conversation around video games, um, for a long time we thought that as people played video games, it was going to increase the number of real-world homicides. Maybe that's the case, but there's a lot of evidence supporting that it's not the case, that video game violence does not equate to real-world violence, that watching rape porn does not equate to real-world rape, that watching BDSM porn does not result in real-world BDSM, um, and we can make this extension that watching some kind of pedophilic porn might not increase the prevalence of pedophilia. Simone, I'm feeling you here. I, I feel afraid to even say these things, to be honest, but I just think it's important. Is, is everybody cool with all of this so far? Okay, all right. I, I, yeah, I, I, just, I do just have good intentions. Yeah, please, Lucy. You were, you were talking about how like if people were watching more pedophilia porn, then that doesn't result in more pedophilia, but the pedophilia porn comes from somewhere, and so the solution kind of becomes a problem in itself. No doubt. No doubt that any pornography that features underaged, unconsenting children, or even consenting children, that it's really negatively affecting the children. But there's a really important aspect of this, which is lolikan hentai, or loli hentai. So loli just means a child, a sexualized child, like Lolita. A hentai is a kind of manga porn, or a Japanese-styled comic book pornography. So within the hentai world, there is a lot of Porno there's a lot of pornographic material that features underage children now, or underage um, underage people that, that features children, and there's a kind of trope about it. I was having a conversation earlier today with someone. They were telling me that um, there's a kind of trope in that um, <laughs> sometimes um, I want, uh, sometimes th they're 
they're told that they're like a vampire that's actually 900 years old, but they were bitten when they were 12 years old, so they still have the body of a 12-year-old, but the mind of an adult, so it's somehow okay, right? So there's this real question, which is, do we want to support the creation of these preteen sex dolls? Do we want to support the creation of Lolikan hentai? Um, so that's the question that we have. I think I do not want this to be a small group discussion. I think that I want to hear from you guys. So I have one more microphone. Um, if anybody's worried to talk, I totally understand, but any points that you have, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, please, Eric. So I guess a really important question about this is do we want to see these people as the victim or as the sort of perpetrator? Because if, I mean, a lot of these sexual preferences, I think people don't choose them. And this is sort of like the real root of it, right? Like, um, like I've heard from many people who are uh, homosexual as well, that it's not like they choose to do it, they're just, you know, they've known it ever since they can remember, and it's like they, they don't get to control who they're attracted to. You know, like people, uh, I think, don't have so much choice, it's like an urge that comes from inside of them. And so if somebody has this urge, uh, to sleep with children, then, I mean, they hear from everywhere that it's wrong, but but they can't sort of silence this voice inside of themselves, right? And so, in some ways, this could be seen as them being a victim, you know? But then, of course, if they act upon these urges, then there's, uh, I think we can all sort of agree that there's, like, a much uh, more important victim in the story, you know? And so, I don't know. I think it's an important lens for us to view this discussion through, you know, like, it, do we have empathy for these people or not, basically? Yeah, you know? absolutely, and I, I think it's it's reminiscent maybe of the story of Grendel, where he recognizes that he's just born a monster, um, and he, maybe he doesn't want to be a monster, but he's born a monster, or maybe rep reminiscent of the story of the scorpion <coughs> and the turtle, where it's just in the scorpion's nature to sting. Uh, yeah, ha. Huh. Uh, no, 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 no. The interesting thing about this whole like sex doll thing and the lollycon hentai and whatever, what are you saying? Like some people are just born with it. I know that I read, um, I forgot the name of the, the title of the book, but basically it was about somebody who's patient, who um, felt like he was a pedophile, but had never acted on it because he had been sexually abused as a child and sexualized as a child. He recognized that it was wrong, but he still had this issue turned into a lot of like mental illnesses and then the book was made and blah, blah, blah. But um, the interesting thing is the focus on skipping the support group part where somebody can go to their counselor and be like, I have this intention or I have this desire. I don't want to act on it. Or I'm, I don't want to be a mon like I, I don't want to harm somebody else, but I still have these issues. Skipping that and being like, well, here's a doll. Like, here's porn. Like, that doesn't, I mean, it does in one hand, I'm not gonna go touch a kid because like, I've found an outlet. But it's skipping this whole metal part of like, morally, I don't want to have that outlet. Like, maybe there are people who have that intention, but they need the support to kind of, I feel like any kind of fetish you have, any fetish, there are a lot that are acceptable, some aren't, that's a personal thing. But I think a question everyone should ask themselves is why do I have this fetish? And, <laughs> and uh, what does my fetish mean to me and other people? Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. So. Um, uh, if you'd like to continue having this kind of conversation, you're definitely invited to. Um, otherwise, the small group discussion that we're going to be moving into... Uh, oh, sorry, actually. No, I think we're just going to move on to fetish psychology. Um, when, we, when we go on, if anybody wants to revisit this, that's cool. Um, but for right now, we're going to move on. Is that all right with everybody? Is that okay? Okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about fetish psychology and kind of why fetishes exist. Does that sound cool? That sounds good? All right, cool. And then we're going to have uh, a demonstration um, by two of our performers that I'm really excited for, really excited for.
Whew. All right. Can everybody, um, could you all just do a favor for me? Um, could everybody do a favor? Um, I want us all just to sit up, sit up right, sit up straight, sit up straight. And then uh, together, we're all going to just inhale together. And then we're going to exhale together. And then we're going to inhale together. And then we're going to vomit. <laughs> We're done. We did it. Nice work. We respected it. I'm really proud of you all. Thank you so much. Can I just get a round of applause for everybody for sitting through that? Thank you so much.